I don't remember what was said when I caught you two in bed. But now I sit here drinking shit beer, chasing Johnny Walker. In. Welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. First off, thank you so much for your messages about the last episode. Bobby was so kind and wonderful. I'm glad that even the non clowns out there related to what he had to say. I'm doing pretty good. Well, no. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, so here's something I didn't factor into sober dating. Drunk text. It's been so long since I sent one. I forgot they exist. I've said several times, I don't need to date a sober person. It'd be nice for them to understand, but it's not a requirement. I get that most people are normal and can somehow control their intake. But I forgot about drunk text. Y'all gotta quit that shit, man. I'm in a place where I mean what I say. So when I, I don't know, theoretically, get a late night text about how wonderful and kind and amazing I am and how I'm falling so hard for you from a guy I've seen like twice, my brain didn't even register the possibility that this was a drunk text. I was like, ah, damn, I thought we were just banging. I spent all night trying to figure out how to reply, should I even reply, how not to hurt anyone's feelings, which then turned into, am I just running away from real connection? Maybe I should try to open up. He seems nice enough. Don't fear being vulnerable. Be a grown-up. Open your heart. But the text kept coming, and they got less and less sensical, and then I got a slurred phone call, and that's when I realized, this motherfucker is drunk. I am two hours into an existential crisis, journaling about my commitment issues and spiraling into anxiety, and he was just like, partying. (laughs) Which is fine. Have fun. That's great. But not at the expense of my sanity. He doesn't even know this happened. Mostly because I just stopped talking to him. Like I do. I have a thing about cutting people out of my life. Maybe we'll get into that. I don't know. But my issues aside, nobody warned me about this. Texting is a major part of modern dating. So now every time I get a text from a guy, which is often, I'm dating a lot now. I'm very proud of that. A lot's changed from season one. (laughs) But now every time I get one, I have to look at what time it is, wonder if this is peak bar hour, and question, is he opening up to me or is he just going to laugh this off tomorrow? I don't know. Did y'all hear that? My stomach just growled. Huh. Maybe I'll leave that in. (laughs) If any of y'all have experience with this, please message me. I don't want to cut off like 90% of the dating pool, but I also don't know how to navigate this. I don't have an end to this rant. I am just sharing an unexpected plot twist. (laughs) I honestly should have asked today's guest about this because he makes plot twists for a living. I always describe this podcast as me talking to artists and performers who live and work in party scenes. But this week's episode, I talked to someone who had a way different experience. Jeff Ruiner is an author and journalist. We've known each other for several years, but I didn't know he was sober until he reached out to me to write an article about this podcast. It was really cool. I was the whole full front page of the Houston Chronicle entertainment section. And I might be biased, but I think it was the best headline ever written. Stripping Clown Explores Sobriety, One Podcast at a Time. (laughs) Yep, that's me. While being an author isn't typically associated with the rock star lifestyle, unless you're Hunter S. Thompson, who partied enough for everyone ever, addiction is still an issue within the community because it is, as Jeff called it, a creative isolationist culture. We discuss internet bullying, the science of dopamine, and fake love, which I could do a whole separate episode on, and probably will. I hope you enjoy it. Here's me and Jeff. This is usually the part where I tell people and like it kind of explain my story so they understand that it's like super casual and um, what my thing is. But you know what my thing is. So it's a little bit different. I know way more about you now than you probably know about me. <laughs> yeah. Strip a clown, flipped your truck, and now you're wandering around through Houston finding all the sober weirdos that you can to try to build something out of that. And I and I applaud you for it. I, I recommended you so much in group therapy. <gasps> really? And, oh, thank you. And I had a lot of people who came back and like, wow, she was really interesting. <gasps> as if you being boring was the thing that was going to come up. <laughs> 
I mean, I get it though, because honestly, that's why I started the podcast is that I was looking at different recovery stuff, mm-hmm. and I a, a lot of what I personally found was really slow and sad and kind of boring. And it's like, wow, y'all kind of make quitting sound like the worst. <laughs> See, I, I come from a completely different thing because my mom uh, went through programs, uh, mm-hmm. I, I think about five years ago is when she went through. Oh, okay. And I'm from East Houston, mm-hmm. so everybody in her AA group is insane. Mm-hmm. As one of them puts it, they put the hot and psychotic. <laughs> So, so she'll oh, come god. in and it's like it's like oh god I had I had this really weird meeting and I'm like okay what happened it's like well there's this one armed dwarven former pimp who mm-hmm. had some things going down and I'm like yeah that sounds like the definition of things oh, going down oh yeah so I once I, had a threesome with a one armed girl I okay but I not a dwarf was, yeah no not a dwarf no, oh okay no. well they, they got me by one that's one right. characteristic away well you know it's important to have goals Kiki so now you <laughs> you have something to aim mm-hmm. for um yeah it's. That's funny, though. Thank you for, for suggesting it. I keep saying I'm going to make little cards and, like, leave them at recovery centers. I just haven't got around to it. <laughs> it's, I, I think it would because one of the things I really love about you and, and also people, like I, I told you earlier that I interviewed an art, uh, Alexa Kiss from Everclear. Yeah. He's 30 years awesome. sober, uh, God, like, I think so this cool. month. So him, uh, Eliza Dushku, people like that, they, you really start to find out that a lot of the cool people in the world are making an effort to n- to not drink and to not use. Absolutely. But they're very quiet about it mm-hmm. because they don't want to make people who are still doing things feel bad. Exactly. But um, you or don't like mind... Or be- perceived as like judgy. <laughs> or perceived as judgy. So yeah. that's what I like about you is that you, you, you're you not... It's not that you're making sobriety cool. You're just <laughs> shining a light. Definitely not doing that. No, but you're <laughs> shining a light on people. And I think it's really good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's... Uh, honestly, that's... A- the big thing about it is that like I wanted to like normalize it because when I wanted to quit drinking, I didn't know anybody who didn't drink. Yeah. And I certainly didn't know, you know, random celebrities and rock stars and all that stuff because, you know, my understanding was, of course, everybody blacks out every day. Mm-hmm. That's that's what you do. And if you're cool, even more so. That was really interesting to me as I started to meet more people. And then, you know, you start to read articles and do stuff. And it's like, oh, there's a lot of amazing, talented, smart, fucking cool as shit people who don't drink. It then became like, oh, duh, because you, t- you tend to have a lifestyle, perhaps, that is very interesting and crazy and stuff. And so you reached, I don't know, max capacity mm-hmm. <laughs> at some point. And so, yeah, I, I want to talk to people and, and, yeah, make it okay and normal and not weird that you don't drink. And... The, one of the things I like about your show is is you 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 focus so much on the you go out to a lot of places that are party atmospheres. Mm-hmm. You know, you got the burlesque thing, you've got the comedy thing. Mm-hmm. I'm a writer. Mm-hmm. I'm home by myself. Okay, but it's still like a thing, isn't that it, like the whole thing is like a uh, write drunk, edit sober? It, exactly. <laughs> it's like every it's, every drunken writer thinks they're Ernest Hemingway. Exactly. You know? Yeah, like it's still part of the culture is that, of course, you're tortured and have problems, right? Exactly. And I was a journalist, too, so I'd go over to, like, Houston Press and pick up my, you know, paycheck and come home with a bottle that they would just give me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it. it's it's very isolationist, which, as you know, as well, as like you can be surrounded by people. You can still feel very isolated, and mm-hmm. so drinking can do that. But, um, you know, once I started going full-time and I was home all the time, you know, nothing's there to stop you but your willpower. Mm. And if a sufficient number of events occur that make you start drinking to get away from them, mm-hmm. then, I mean, it's just there and that's all you are. Yeah, it's just, it's easy. And it was easy to justify for myself because I've written amazing things while mm-hmm. completely plastered. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I've, I've literally won awards for articles that were not written sober. And, and that's amazing <laughs> and great, but... You know, it's it's like the old joke when people's like, "Oh, I smoke pot so that I'll be like the Beatles." I'm like, mm-hmm. "You're not going to toke up and bust out Sergeant Pepper, mm-hmm. y'all." No, 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 no. So, I mean, there was always that justification. It's like, "Oh, well, you know, I've done great writing while I'm drunk, so I should keep drinking to yeah. write." But no, that, yeah. I've done some horrible things yeah. too. Well, it's, it, and it's just easy. Is it comes out? It's, it's easier to believe that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so currently you're Houston Chronicle. I, I'm a freelance writer for Houston Chronicle, mm-hmm. Houston Press. Anybody who will really cut me a check. Got it. <laughs> and and I am an author and a short story writer as well. Yeah. So how long have you been a writer? I started writing um, about 11, 12 years ago. Okay. I, I actually ran the only weekly Rocky Horror newsletter in the country. 
Okay. <laughs> that's that's something uh, me and, and a girl who used to run the Rocky Horror Picture Show down here decided we were going to do to give out as a freebie. So I published a newsletter, and it was the only one in the country for a while. And then later in life, I kind of let it go as I started playing Rockstar. But when that stopped happening with Black Math Experiment, I contacted the Houston Press to see if they wanted writers because I didn't have money to go see Peter Murphy. <laughs> So you were like, let me interview him? And I was just like, so I'll give you 500 words if you just let me go to the show for free. And that is literally all I did to become a journalist. Shut up. It's, and people ask, did you go to school for journalists? Like, nope, bullshitted my way in. 110%. Oh, my God. Okay, so going back, weekly Rocky Horror newsletter. But weekly, How is there news weekly about Rocky Horror? Because you're talking about not that long ago. It's, I mean, you would sit there and you would write up like, oh, it's, you know, Richard O'Brien's birthday. Here's a thing about his life. You know, here's some uh-huh. trivia about Rocky Horror. Here's a review of some stuff that other people, it's just like a four page thing. Four pages a weekly. It's there's uh, only so many birthdays a year. Kiki, I am a person who wrote a thousand words on the top five farts in video games once. Okay, I could make wait, anything go. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, this is very confusing for me because on one hand I hate restroom humor <laughs> so much, and I do not talk about restroom things. <laughs> But I feel that I cannot leave that alone. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> it's for for a while there, you know, because you're freelance. Everything you do is per article. Yes. And when you have a wife who's going to nursing school, and you're providing all the money. So I would work full time, and I would write while I was doing it. And at one point, I was turning in thirty articles a week. Wow. And when you do that, horrible ideas seem really great. So my editor went off on vacation, which meant I had no restrictions. <laughs> It was Jekyll and Hyde, so I just like just like started turning stuff in, and nobody would question me. And she came back like, "Video game farts, Jeff? Really?" I'm like, "Don't even pretend you would not have approved of that." But okay, why? Just because <laughs> I saw a funny fart video about a video game, and I thought I could make I could make money off of this. Okay, without and, going into details, from number five to number one, uh, like uh, Abe's Odyssey is like you could use fart to move keep characters from one side of the screen to okay, another. You don't, no details, just the games. <laughs> so, Abe's Odyssey, uh, Smash Brothers. Um, yeah, Wario farts in that. <laughs> okay. And I forget this. It was a long time ago. I've written a lot of stupid articles. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> Weekly Rocky Horror <laughs> writer. So I did that. Then I did, became a real journalist and okay. like won awards and did like, you know, investigative stuff. And now I, I mostly work on my books and stuff. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and occasionally I talk to stripping clowns. Yes. <laughs> oh, goodness. Sorry. This is just so much information <laughs> flying at me right now. <laughs> you have been freelance for how long? Uh, about 11 years now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And I still get mm-hmm. so nervous. Like, I I like had to call, like when I did my interview earlier today, I have to sit on my hands because they shake so bad. I can't take notes. I have to record everything and do it later on. Oh, really? I never stop being nervous. I'm nervous talking to you, and I've known you for like five years. Really? Yeah. Oh, no. Don't be nervous. Yeah. That's fine. We're just talking. So you've been a writer for that long. How, if you're not in a party party scene, how... If you don't have any comparison, how did you realize you had a problem then? Because I, I mean, I, I realized I had a problem the way a lot of people do. A lot of, you know, quiet people who are at home do. And that's, you know, I hurt the people I love because I could not stop. Mm-hmm. The basic thing that happened was I used to cover, and I still do a lot, I, I would cover the alt-right scene, the Gamergate people, mm-hmm. all of these this burgeoning neo-fascist movement in America. Mm-hmm. And as you get good at that, you get their attention. Mm -hmm. And what happened was Breitbart News came after me and came after my my then seven, six, seven-year-old daughter. Oh, my God. So, I mean, I went from getting about a death threat a day, which is pretty normal. Okay. um, For... For writing about, you know, neo-Nazis okay. and stuff like that. Okay. It's like, I get okay. the, like a death threat a day or so. But I went from getting one a day to getting one a minute. Oh, my God. I, um, they put my daughter's face on the front of Breitbart. Shut up. And um, I, I had to call the Harris County Sheriff's uh, Department to come out and let them know that they were probably going to SWAT me. And they never did. Uh, which saw, so what, what, what is SWAT? Swatting is when you call in a fake um, bomb threat or domestic situation so that they send the SWAT team and hopefully 
come in with all guns blazing. Um, I've had friends whose dogs have been shot. Uh, there was a, oh my god! There was one guy whose baby's nose is blown off by a flash <gasps> grenade. So oh my I, god! So I was terrified. You know, my daughter still can't play outside because her picture's been on the on the paper of this you know right wing hate site. Oh my god! So all that happened. I, didn't that guy just go to jail for that? There were some gamers that kept calling SWAT teams on each other, and yeah, a couple. Of, they've started getting some people to jail, but I mean, even high profile cases like Anita Sarkeesian or Zoe Quinn, people like the FBI are involved. I mean, it's illegal, but you only get six months in jail, and most police departments won't dedicate resources to it. So there's oh, no stopping it. Wow. And since then, you know, me and a couple of other people have built up a, a network of how to deal with it. But emotionally, um, professionals are not pre- are pre- aren't prepared for it. When I was in rehab, when I was in the hospital, mm-hmm. I, I walked out on three therapists who just could not seem to grasp that y- you can't. You can't get the internet to forgive you. Yeah. It's this faceless thing that never ends. Yeah. And so I became very scared. I developed some PTSD from it and I I just started drinking more and more during the day and then, you know, at one point you realize you can't stop. Oh, wow. I didn't realize all that. That's intense. Yeah, and you know, it's just you, you it becomes the way you deal with it. And again, you're alone all the time. Yeah. So Even more so because you're fucking scared to do anything. It's like, you know, yeah. every time somebody would come up on the street and recognize me because my, my picture's on my byline now. Mm-hmm. So there's like, oh, you're Jeff Runner from the Houston Press. I flinch because do they like me that, or yeah. are they, you know, going to start calling me a cuck and telling me that they, you know, want Muslims to rape my daughter or something. Oh, my God. So that's why did I start drinking? Um, because I thought it was normal, but why did I, why, why was I unable to stop? Because I went through emotional, severe trauma and didn't have a way to deal with it. Wow. So. So, one time, a very small group of people came after me because I posted an email from Comic Palooza. It was a very small group of people with multiple accounts who started the hashtag slutty McNobody. Oh, Lord. <laughs> to which my friend Dave said, you're not nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Completely not joking, which I will never forgive him for because it was <laughs> fucking hilarious. It's nice to have defenders. <laughs> but um, that, I mean, that only lasted about a week, but it was a mind fuck because, yeah, I didn't want to, I work Online, I work on my computer. Everything is marketing, social media, all that stuff. And I did, I couldn't work because I didn't want to open up any of my things because it would just be hundreds of notifications from people calling me a whore and and sharing things. And I was constantly. I also gave them a little bit more power than they actually had. Where in my head, I was like, "What if they hack my computer and find these things?" And like, they didn't have, they didn't know right. what the fuck they were doing. Um, but yeah, that was just a week of stuff, and it fucked with me. Yeah. So I can't even imagine that and your daughter and everything. It was absolutely terrifying. And I've seen people in that same sphere who get targeted by these groups, the, mm-hmm. the Chan boards and, and the Redditors and everything like yeah. that. And a lot of them do have problems. A lot of them drink too much. And, you know, their mental health professionals are just not yet really equipped to deal with that sort of thing. This is, they're not caught up, honestly. They're, they're not caught up. They just they don't understand it. I mean, as, as Zoe Quinn said, if you try to bring suit against these people, you're lucky if you've got a judge who knows what Twitter is. Exactly, yeah. So, as you said, and it's all encompassing. I mean, I had to, I had to get an, an automated bot to start blocking people. I mean, my block list across social media is nearly 60,000 people. Wow. Just, so, is that just based on keywords, or how does that work? It's linked to, to hashtags, and I, don't, I, I actually don't know how it works. A friend okay. of mine developed it. That's interesting. And okay. she was going to explain it to me, but I what, didn't pay attention. <laughs> he was like, I don't care. Just, just make it stop. Just make it stop. So, yeah. I mean, okay. it's, that's that's how the drinking got out of hand. And then mm-hmm. once it had a hold of me, you know, every alcoholic has that moment where you've crossed the line, mm-hmm. where, you know, you no longer have the control. And once you cross that line, there's no there's no getting back from it. What happened that made you realize that you'd crossed that line? I had a really good week where I thought I had beaten things and everything was brighter mm-hmm. and I was stronger and I was so proud of myself and I was so proud of myself that I lied when I said I was going to an AA meeting and went and got a bottle of vodka and poured it into a uh, one of those giant Coke Zeros you get from Whataburger. And I came home and I got drunk and I passed out and when I woke up, my 
wife told me that I needed to go somewhere. Mm. And that I gave up, you know, Mm -hmm. that was, I think that that's, there's a reason the first step in the whole 12 step thing is surrender Mm -hmm. is when you stop lying to yourself that you, that you have any control over it. And when I was in rehab, you saw all kinds of people. It's like, oh, this is my second time through. It's like, well, what happened the first time? It's like, oh, I thought I could beat it for a while and then Mm -hmm. go back and, and, you know, I'm the Hermione Granger of rehab. (laughs) So I was like, I'm just sitting here learning from everybody else's mistake and doing all the workbooks and stuff they give me and like staying up late and finishing homework. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's really all that happened was I just, I lost the illusion that I was ever going to beat it on my own, that it was ever going to be in control. Wow. Because of a, I I just spoke with uh, somebody for the podcast. I am starting over. Because, so I only recently got the big book, mm, we'll say maybe four or five months ago. Mm-hmm. It was about halfway through and uh, reached out to somebody that I asked to be my sponsor. Uh, and he said no. <laughs> <laughs> he said that I needed a, a female sponsor and explained to me why, like, you have to have somebody who understands your point of view and things. And I was like, well, I don't trust anybody. So I guess then I'll sponsor. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was like, well, I'll be your sober buddy. First thing. Uh, start with step one. And I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm already halfway through. (laughs) I already got through all the steps and then the book keeps going and I'm just in that part. And he's like, go back to step one, (laughs) read that and we're going to work on that. And the defeat that I felt where I was like, I'm already on page 400 or whatever it was and I'm Mm. all the way over here. And I was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't do any of it. Right. I was just uh, read, 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 read. Okay, I'm fixed. Exactly. And I wasn't, I wasn't working any of it. Um, so I know that you you actively like worked the steps, correct? I I got started while I was while I was in the while I was in rehab mm-hmm. and I do credit AA with with getting me back on track. Mm-hmm. I did not complete the steps. Mm-hmm. I, I quit around uh, step three and I, <laughs> Okay. But I did work on it and I did I've still got a notebook at home full of everything I did mm-hmm. about it. Um and it's 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 there's a book called uh, Beyond Mystery by E.M. James, which I would recommend you get, but it's almost impossible to get. I just happened to stumble across it in a used bookstore, like a uh-huh. signed copy from a hundred print run of it. So, okay. But the thing that I really got from that book, that I got more from any of the AA material, was that AA is really bad at th- at helping you deal with things that are not your fault. Mm. For dealing with things that are your fault, for mm. the mistakes that you've made and continue to make, mm-hmm. AA is great. And it's an amazing journey that I think a lot of people should go on. Mm-hmm. But just as I talked about how mental health professionals aren't necessarily equipped to deal with certain problems, yeah. AA is not a replacement for therapy, mm-hmm. which I think a lot of people use it for. Oh, absolutely. And which I think is good in some aspects. You know, I, I, I will tell people it's free therapy mm-hmm. basically because a lot of people cannot afford to get help and so that I'm like there's a, you have something yeah. at least find a connection with other people and that's why it's become what it is that's why you can get assigned to what is arguably a religious organization mm-hmm. from the court it's not necessarily because AA is terribly effective it's yes and no mm-hmm. but it's free and nobody wants to put any money into mm-hmm fixing people with addiction problems when i was when i was in rehab just and that was really really hard to do you found all these people who had loss in their life and they had pain in their life and they had you know big aching bits and we went through group therapy and single therapy and all of that and then Mm -hmm. we went through the AA stuff all put together it helps you rebuild yourself yeah but i understand a lot why people who just try to go to aa without that deep uh, de- uh, deprivation that I went through, why mm-hmm. it doesn't work for them. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's definitely not for everybody. And that's uh, something why I like to talk, talk to people who've done different things yeah. on the podcast because I get that there's a million ways to do it and there is no correct, one correct way to do the thing. Yeah. Um, I think that from what I've noticed, a lot of them kind of boil down to you having to figure out why you have the problem. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it's not, it's not just the problem, it's the core of why, why did this seem like an acceptable way 
to live. Yeah. Figure that shit out, <laughs> and then we'll work on the rest. <laughs> One of the things I did when I got out of hospital was, as I said, Hermione Granger of rehab. Mm-hmm. I got a lot of books about mm-hmm. the history of alcoholism in America. I have, I'm still reading this 500-page uh, textbook about the history of, of substance abuse, mm-hmm. uh, which you learn a lot of fun things. For instance, did you know that they tried to create a vaccine for alcoholism by getting horses drunk and then cutting them and then rubbing uh, cloth on the blood and then giving it to people? Shut up. I did not know that. Science is fun. <laughs> I'm going to guess in the 40s. It. Oh, yeah, no, earlier. This is like, oh. like 1910. Oh, okay. So. Damn. Damn, but, I was going to say 20, and I was like, no, that's, that can't be right. But reading the history of how we treat uh, alcoholism and, and drug abuse, you see that the, it's gone back and forth. Sometimes they thought alcoholism is a symptom. Sometimes it is the underlying cause. And mm-hmm. basically the consensus that uh, science has come to is that it doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. You should treat underlying issues because people with deep trauma should get treatment regardless. Period, yeah. And you should treat the symptoms of alcoholism because not having drunk people killing themselves is also a good thing. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's the God question. It's like whether God exists or not is irrelevant to the impact that religion or something has. This is just a symptom. It's like, it doesn't matter. You just have to fix the problem regardless. Yeah, either way. Exactly. Have you noticed your writing, like, changed since you quit drinking? It's, like, was it hard at first because you were used to being drunk? <laughs> it's, it's gotten faster. <laughs> but <laughs> now, like, when you, when you first quit drinking, did you struggle with that? Or were you instantly just magical? <laughs> I was not any better or any worse of a writer. I was just somebody who was able to, how to put this, lying is really, (laughs) drinking is for liars. (laughs) And fiction is for liars as well. (laughs) Okay. So I was just as good one way or the other, because I spent a long time of my life, not necessarily sober, but Mm. the least, but the least drunk person in a room all the time. I would go to parties all the time. And I would leave at 2 o'clock because by 2 o'clock, everybody who was an adult had gone home. <laughs> and, and that's why I was there till 7 a.m. And, and, <laughs> and everybody else who was there is just finding a reason to get more and more fucked up oh, until absolutely. the sun chases them away. So I, I wouldn't say that my art got better or worse one way or the other. I can still spin all kinds of tales. I just mm-hmm. try to do it in a more constructive direction. It. I do have less bizarre ideas, Mm -hmm. less easily now. Like the novel I'm working on right now was about sentient mushrooms that grow in disused political biographies and they secretly run the world. Okay, wait, say that sentence one more time. It's about sentient mushrooms. Okay, got those words. That grow in disused uh, political biographies. Okay, that's a part. Disused political biographies. What does that mean? Okay, you know how like when you go to, around election time, you see everybody's writing a book, like Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton. Everybody's got a got book. It. <gasps> All right, oh. people buy those books. Uh huh. Like political action groups buy them at, at uh, retail price. Oh, to like up the sale. Yeah, so they, they can say, "Oh, it's a best-selling novel." Oh, interesting. So, and then in my view, they all go to a warehouse where nobody reads them. So okay. and then mushrooms grow in the wet pages, and they <gasps> secretly learn everything about politics, and they secretly control us. Now, I had that okay, thought. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. How do they go from being mushrooms that ate books to controlling us? Uh, well, because they can send letters. Okay. <laughs> so they're controlling. They're still in the warehouse. Still in the warehouse. And controlling by sending letters. Yes. Emails? Yeah, emails, blog posts, you know, strongly worded letters to important people. Do the people know that they're mushrooms? Not yet. Oh. Now, I had that thought completely sober. Uh-huh. So that's so I can still create those things, but you know, bizarre ideas used to come a lot, a lot more easily to me. Mm-hmm. So I have to work at it now. But the ideas I come I up with now are better. I, well, yes, because that's an interesting idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, like you're like it's harder to come up with bizarre ideas, but this one mushroom thing. <laughs> um, I believe All right. that that is. Because your brain is still processing not having things in it, mm. <laughs> and that they are the bizarre ideas are going to flow mm-hmm. the longer that you are comfortable just not having those things in you. I, I don't know. I feel. What am I trying to say? 
I get it. <laughs> I think that's very common where people are like, no, like I used to be more creative or this and that. And like these things just came to me out of nowhere. Those things are always inside of you. It's yeah. just kind of like was muscle memory of like, this is how they happened. Mm -hmm. And so you find the other triggers and you learn how to like open up those pathways in your brain naturally without the things. And then you're like, oh, sh that shit was always in there. I'm fucking bananas. <laughs> Like, those things are there. You just don't have the pathways built to get to them right now easily. Well, I mean, take yourself. I mean, I'm, I'm making an uh, assumption here, but I'm pretty mm -hmm. safe that it's an assumption that um, your career and the things that you're most known for were not sober ideas. No, they were not sober ideas. But I do, I do think I was always a creative person. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that was a way that I could, again, just like, I could find them easier because I was numb and spewing garbage out of my mouth and sometimes would remember the garbage. <laughs> um, and so when I quit, it was, it was difficult at first. Like, okay, for example, for comedy, mm -hmm. I found it very difficult to go on stage sober because I would get shaky and nervous and I felt like everybody could see. The ideas, like you said, I, when I was writing, they weren't as fucking bizarre. I have been told that some of my jokes are absurd like about how I want to fuck birds this is not true I always feel like I need to clarify because now my friends all make jokes about how I have a bird fetish I do not actually have a bird fetish I just think it is a funny concept but in the last year I'm like oh now I feel like I'm far more creative I am so much better the it's, it was harder to get to the ideas, but now the quality of the ideas are so much better, and I'm figuring out how to just turn that thing on mm -hmm. at will now. Uh, but I just think that's something that you have to figure out because the pathways aren't made in your brain. You don't know how to reach those things. They used to just come to you, quote unquote. It's like, no, they weren't coming to you. You were fucking... Uh, the thing, you know why I think that is, mm -hmm. and this, this came up a lot when I was in rehab, is when you have SUD, when you have substance use disorder, and you've what you've done is you've retrained your brain to only produce dopamine mm -hmm. from your substance. And you tell people that you, it produces dopamine, and they say, oh, well, that makes you feel good. That's not what dopamine does. In, in an evolutionary sense, what dopamine does is it tells you the jaguar has gone away and you can stop panicking now. That's what oh. dopamine does. It doesn't create joy. It creates a lack of panic. Before I started drinking real heavily, I had an, I had an acid reflux condition, and mm -hmm. I would have these horrible attacks, and I would go into my bedroom and wrap a blanket around my head and scream because I wanted to die. Okay. But at the end of that was a sudden cessation of pain, and that is a feeling that if you've never experienced it before, you cannot explain to another person. If there is a heaven, that is what heaven feels like. It is mm -hmm. the sudden cessation of all agony. And mm -hmm. when you are addicted and you take that drink or you do whatever you do that's the feeling that hits you it's not it's not a feeling of pleasure it's a feeling of not panicking mm, anymore mm -hmm. and that's why it feels normal you're, you're hitting what you think a normal supposed to feel like exactly so now that i can you know go outside and be with my family and exercise and do things that, that produce that dopamine in, in a more healthy manner I, I'm not panicked, and the idea of creating little dark, whimsical things to make people happy mm -hmm. or scared comes a lot easier. So, and I, I imagine that's what it what it is with you. Is like you know, as you said, you you didn't want to go on stage because you'd feel shaky and mm -hmm. you'd feel panic because your body is not used to producing the thing that makes you feel comfortable up there. But now mm -hmm. you go up there and you're kiki fucking marooned, <laughs> you know, because you're because I'm sure you're like me. You get on stage and you feel at home there. You can mm -hmm. feel something. You feel more normal up there than you feel in oh, other absolutely. places. Exactly. Alcohol and everything else takes that away from you and tells you, no, 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 you can't feel good on stage. you got to mm -hmm. feel good here with this in you. That's the only way you're going to feel good. And it will take stage from you. It will take everything away from you one bit, bit, until mm -hmm. all that's left is the thing that makes that trigger. And then you die. Huh. I did not realize that that's what dopamine was. I read this thing that was talking about how when um, babies are in their mama's bellies, mm. that women who were in 
very difficult houses, whether it was a stress, financial stress, mm-hmm. um, you know, physical stress that they were with an abusive person, just general fear, things like that, and usually low income, right. that they constantly have whatever the thing is, the fight or flight thing. Mm-hmm. There's that panic that you have, the survival thing, and that it is shooting whatever, I forget the name is, of that chemical, ser- is it serotonin? No, serotonin is good. Whatever it is, yeah. into the baby. And so they get chemically addicted to this thing. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, the baby's born and that's where they think that a lot of the, um, that's higher likelihood of depression and anxiety and all those issues because on some level that's what feels normal and comfortable is because you got addicted to that, that whatever that adrenaline is of things falling apart around you. And so that it becomes like a, a spiral into generational situations because you're not then developing all the things that you need. You're not focus- they're not focusing on school and things like that because their brain is so busy pumping out this other kind of adrenaline that they're not actually growing and developing mm-hmm. as you know what we consider a healthy human being. It's I mean normalcy is is self the problem, I think. As you mm-hmm. said, it's like when you put babies in that stress um, situation and then when they're out they're still in that stress situation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, babies are actually much more annoying when they're not inside a person. <laughs> and you can become addicted, I think, to normalcy. It's even more addictive than anything else. Mm-hmm. What I used to do is every morning I would get up and I'd say, I'm going to take the dog out. And I would take the dog out and I would leave the dog in the little dog park area of my apartment complex. And I would walk over to the bushes and I would throw up. I did mm-hmm. it every morning. And I it gets to the point that you're almost looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. When when I was in rehab, you know, everybody talked about how terrible their normalcy had become. It, it mm-hmm. became almost a contest, and everybody would say, "I would, you know, I'd go in the bathroom and I I couldn't look at myself, I couldn't shave, I couldn't do anything, I couldn't even brush my teeth." That wasn't me. I became addicted with watching the light die in my own eyes. I would just sit there and like stare at myself for 15 minutes and just watch everything good mm. rot away. And it, you can become just enamored of terrible, terrible things. I'm sure you've seen people mm-hmm. in, in performances, uh, people who go off on self-destructive tangents oh, yeah. for no reason that you can, you can think of. Mm-hmm. I used to be a, a Mexican wrestler way back in the Shut day. Shut up. Yeah, I was a you luchador. You were a luchador? I, I, was in, I was in AAA. I was El Mimo Peligroso, the dangerous oh, mime. Oh, how funny. Which that joke doesn't translate real well in Spanish. <laughs> but I didn't speak Spanish, so it's like, oh, I'll be an evil mime. And then I work <gasps> out. Oh my god! And people say, "Like, well, why did you become a wrestler?" And like, honestly, it was masochism. I liked mm-hmm. being slammed. I liked having control of the pain. Mm-hmm. And you know, it, like I said, it's just weird what normalcy can breed in you. Oh yeah, that stress environment. You know, people around you drinking, mm-hmm. people around you using drinking wine made me think of my mom, mm-hmm. who I loved and thought was great, and then yeah. had a problem. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, so when I heard about that that study that was just talking about all that. It made so much sense to me because I definitely, you know, my had a, my mom was under a lot of stress. She was a very <laughs> young mom, not financially stable. Like we grew up in a, a trailer park and my dad was in and out all the time. And so there was a lot of constant financial and just family stressors Mm -hmm. everywhere and then it made me reevaluate and think about my teenage and going into 20 year old stuff I was definitely you know like oh the crazy girlfriend like Mm -hmm. I was with my first boyfriend for almost a decade that was a really bad abusive relationship but I will be very honest and say like yeah he was a piece of shit Mm -hmm. but I was I was awful too yeah. In hindsight, looking back, it was like, oh, I was definitely addicted to the adrenaline rush of the screaming, of the fighting. I wanted all of the chaos around me. Mm-hmm. And then the makeup afterwards was so intense. And um, so I, I definitely was constantly creating chaos mm-hmm. because now I understand that felt normal to me. If, yeah. things are nor- if things are fine, I'm like something... Even now, I'm having to tell myself it's okay for things to just be Mm -hmm. that feels so weird to me it feels like something's wrong when nothing is wrong (laughs) exactly it's like you you have to come up with a balance and you have to find another way to be happy you have to find quiet things and you have to find 
healthy ways to express yourself. You know, the thing that they talked about a lot in uh, rehab was, you know, the connection between physical fitness and not being addicted is way higher than oh, you think it is. Absolutely. Well, we're talking about the adrenaline. You exactly. have the fight or flight thing in you. Mm-hmm. You have this built up adrenaline that leads to anxiety and depression and everything else. And you don't physically get out this thing. There's a thing in you saying, run away from the lion that's chasing you or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you never get that out. And it's just sitting in your brain. It's just like, your brain is in a fucking pool of this shit Mm -hmm. that you do not, you're not physically releasing it. That's why so many people, before they go on stage, you'll see them do like a little jog or jump up and down. Like they're trying to get that shit out so they can walk on stage and be normal. Exactly. But we don't, talk about that because you don't want to make people not sound like they have anything to do with their depression. Not that, I mean, I get it. It is. Of course, I understand right. like there are issues and chemical imbalances and stuff, but there are things that you can do about to an extent to it. It's, I mean, and, and we talked about normalcy again, because what do you see? Would you see somebody all amped up backstage and they're, you know, twitching and they're weird and they're, and they're mm-hmm. crazy. What do you tell them? Have a drink. Mm, oh, yeah, yeah. That's Calm what, down. That's Calm what it's down. like. You need a drink. No, mm-hmm. no, you don't. You know what Kurt Cobain used to do whenever he was nervous before he went on stage? Mm. He would wrestle people. Really? Yeah, backstage. He would just, <laughs> that's, how we met Courtney, that's how we met Courtney Love. <laughs> they started wrestling, like on the floor, like Greco room and wrestling. Oh, and, my God. And, you know, that's fine. And, yes, Kurt had, you know, issues later. Down blah, 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 yeah, blah. Yeah. But, you know, that's fine. It's like, you know, go for a jog. Jump up and down. Just, mm-hmm. you know, play rock, paper, scissors. It doesn't matter. Mm. You don't have to substitute quirkiness and strangeness for a glass of something or a mm-hmm. shot of something or a smoke of something. You don't have to do that. And we've made it the go-to. And I, I think that it's a big reason why a lot of us end up the way we do. Yeah. You know? So, I have to say... You, I'm, I am so glad that you are working through this and you seem to be in a much better place and will continue to, I'm sure. But? No, no, but, no, oh, but. Okay. It's, it's an and, not a but. And, so in my head, I know I still, I, I still struggle. I'm, I'm a workaholic. I know that. Um, I, I have issues with sugar. I basically I've replaced a lot of things and I see I see it mm-hmm. but I'm very much like well it's still the lesser evil and I'll work on that part when I get there I have difficulty just being mm-hmm. I have difficulty just enjoying myself mm-hmm. I feel that I always should be working or I, I have intense guilt in my head once I had a family that would all go away <laughs> Because I would want to, you know, have park days and dinners and things that I never make time for right now. Yeah. Um, and that all of the issues would just disappear once I had a husband and child. And I'm starting to think, <laughs> as I'm talking to someone with a family, that perhaps I was incorrect. It, um... <laughs> I, you know, my wife saved my life. I love my daughter with all my heart. These, these are my, my everything. Everything I, I do, I do for them. Actually, that's not true. And you got to stop lying to yourself about that. I do a lot of things for me because it's fucking fun. Mm-hmm. And I like being the crazy genius. And mm-hmm. that's great. And it's a great way to be. And you should always be yourself. But I, my family is a huge part of everything around yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, of course. But I see people all the time who have bad days with their kids. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, mommy needs wine. And that's again we t- oh, we talk about this like yes, that is the mommy line culture. It'll oh, it'll yeah. creep in on you and tell you it's like you know because your kids are going to be annoying until you or they die. Mm-hmm. Your family is going to get on your nerves until you or they die. Mm-hmm. It is going to be forever. The one thing I have learned from all of this is none of your problems get easier when you're drunk. Not a single one of them. Mm-mm. And I used to love it's like it's nine thirty. My kids in bed. If they're not asleep, at least they're not bothering me. Mm-hmm. I'm going to sit here with my glass of wine and play my video game and whatever, and that's going to be it. I've earned it. I've deserved it. Mm-hmm. But that's that's not the case. Most early alcoholism studies that were done, a lot of the people who were sent away to the early uh, drying out places, as I said, I was reading a lot of history. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're talking you're talking family people. You're talking you know a lot of housewives. The mm-hmm. prohibition movement was started by women who were tr- were trying to get their husbands to stop drinking up 
the things that they needed in their household. These are people who were yeah. dependent on it. I mean, you know, Carrie Nation did not go out and start hatcheting bars and things because she just didn't like alcohol. She did it because <laughs> women were, you know, being subjugated by men who could not control themselves. Yeah. So, I mean, other people will not fix you. Yeah, but see, that's other people you're talking about. <laughs> and you're special. <laughs> and I... <laughs> I've met you. <laughs> Everything that happened to everybody else, that's yeah. not going to happen to you. Yeah. Well, yet again. You're, um, you're, you're clever and smart and pretty. And where will we keep all these unicorns? Um, I feel like this podcast is just a constant smack in the face of things I already <laughs> knew. <laughs> but I didn't want to know. But I knew. When I was in rehab, <laughs> everybody told the same story. I told this story. It's like, oh, I can't be in here that long, man. They need me. Yeah. But, you, but meanwhile, you know, they were functioning while you weren't no, mentally there. No, they were there. functioning better. I mean, they, my wife doesn't cook very well. But <laughs> it's just like there was a lot of pizza in the house. But other than that, you know, it's like you realize, like, no, you need to sit here and fix yourself and stop, mm. and stop being part of the machine. You mm-hmm. need to take some time, get zen, you know, do some meditation, all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, a, a family is not going to fix that. Yeah. How old is your daughter again? She will be 10 in August. Okay. Does she, I mean, have you talked to her about this? Did she know that you were getting into a space and you're different now? Yes. Yeah. Or, uh, okay. she, she was completely aware. Um, she's deaf on alcohol now. I, she goes to the grocery store with me. And, and you have to walk through the wine aisle to get to, you know, sodas and seltzers yeah. and stuff like that. And because I, I drink like a t- case of seltzer a day. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's like what you said is like with well, the sugar. I'm like I ate like three cookie sandwiches yesterday, mm-hmm. the big chocolate chip cookies with the stuff in the middle. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't I do never, that. I never ate dessert before I quit drinking. Yep. And then it, I, I. So okay, I've heard this a lot, and then I've also heard that it's a myth. I don't believe it though. That uh, the alcohol turns into like sugar in your blood, and so that you have the sugar cravings because your body's like, where's all this fucking sugar that I used to get every day it's part of that also artificial sweeteners partially break down in ethanol oh. which explains why i was drinking a case of coke zero <gasps> a day also don't do that <laughs> yeah no don't do that yeah that makes sense because yeah i like i suddenly wasn't getting who knows how many thousands of calories a day that i previously was getting exactly. from alcohol and so i wanted all the cakes yes so okay that makes sense too i didn't think about the ethanol but yeah, my, mm. my daughter was aware. She she saw things I wish she had not seen. Mm. And she came to visit me when I, when I was in the hospital. And it, it was extremely hard. Mm-hmm. And this is... Did you check yourself in, by the way, or did something happen? I My wife said I was going. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of had a moment of clarity where I said, okay. And so her okay. and my mom picked me up and, and dropped me off over at the over at the park on Gessner. The, the, uh, it's, it's a plate. Memorial Herman calls it the park. Oh, okay, they didn't just, okay. they didn't just okay. drop me on a bench. It's not like something. old yeller. They're just like, oh, like bye, boy. <laughs> no, Sorry. he's going up to a to a farm where he can play with all his writer exactly. friends. No, that's not what happened. <laughs> okay, it's called the park, but it's it, a hospital. Was it a uh, a live in facility? Yeah, yeah I was okay. there about three. I was there three weeks, and then I did about six weeks of outpatient. Where okay. I, w- I went there for like eight hours a day, and then I went there for like three hours a day. Got it. But yes, and so she was aware, and. Um, that's in her memories now. And mm-hmm. I, I, the only thing I can keep reinforcing to her is you, you have an almost certain chance that if you start drinking, you're going to end up like this eventually. Because I drank like normal for, tw- for 10 years. Mm-hmm. without I was, again, I was always the sober, soberest person at the party. Mm-hmm. So I, I try to hold on into her. And the really depressing thing about it is I grew up going over to my aunt and uncle's house and they were rampaging alcoholics who just beat the shit out of each other like oh, all wow. the time. I remember they had a fight at a party and they drug me and my cousins like walking home and they made us like kept getting down in drainage ditches because they were afraid that my drunken uncle was going to drive by and find us. Oh my God. And I still thought, no, I'm going to be special. Like you just said yeah. there, it's like, I thought it's like, no, I've got a handle on it. You ain't got a handle on shit. You just haven't had that one bad day. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, well, I, I know that I don't know your daughter, yeah. but I know people. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine that there is far more power in her observing up close somebody overcome something mm-hmm. and to see that thing and, and to be able to, to respect you and look up to you and see that thing up close and you become the best version of yourself that you could be. 
I would think. It's I'm also not a psychologist. I don't fucking know. No, but, and, <laughs> and we don't lie to her about it. Like, she asked me what abortion was the other day, and I explained it to her as best mm. I could. <laughs> yeah, would have had an older sister. No, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> But, you know, so you, we, we don't lie to her mm-hmm. and she she has seen things up close and personal. And mm-hmm. I just I really hope she's taken from that. I hope I haven't messed her up for life any more than was already guaranteed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we'll, yeah. we'll see. Well, I mean, we're all fucked up. Uh, extremely I, so. I mean, she's going to be. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. But, I, I, I feel really But good. again, like, it's so different to see somebody overcome something and become a one yeah. you know become the best version of themselves that they can be i think that's far more powerful than they you that never happened and you were this fucking you know tgif family mm-hmm. that's not the real world and when you, you i feel like that kind of situation actually i don't feel like i've seen this <laughs> i'm not going to name names but we'll just say there's a upper middle class passive aggressive we don't talk about any of our problems situation and everybody is just perfect Mm -hmm. and nobody talks about the reality of situations and it's so um it'll strangle you and you feel like you're not allowed to talk about your problems you're not allowed to have problems exactly um because everybody else around you is perfect so clearly something's wrong with me for having a problem and it's it's not good you know what it happens is people start fan faking their lives. <gasps> people start finding things that are wrong with them. I spend a lot of my time finding broken, beautiful weirdos in this city. That is my passion. That is my dream. I actually made a, a, a vow to a dying friend that that's what I would do. Is that why you interviewed me? Yes. <laughs> yes you, I mean, I'm pretty broken. You're, you're a broken, beautiful weirdo. But, yeah, okay. you know, but you do good with it. Okay. And going around finding all these artists and all these people who create... The, these amazing bits of music and, and arts and installations and performance like you do, mm-hmm. that it's because they, they have opened themselves up to the world. They have observed around them and they have seen people overcome. If they haven't them, themselves overcome something, mm-hmm. then they have chosen to be hurt by what happens to others. Mm-hmm. But when you're over here and you refuse to see other people's hurts, you find reasons why you're the hero of your damn mediocre story. I like that. Fanfic. What is it? Fanfic? They fanfic their own lives. Fanfic their own lives. That's that's intense. I actually just started doing this thing. You know how you get those like fights in your head mm-hmm. with somebody that don't ever happen, mm-hmm. but you're like, and then I would say this, and they would say this, and I would say that, and like that, just that spiral you get into, or like just confrontations that just weren't going to take place and but maybe you're preparing yourself just in case they yep. were I've started it's almost like like the dog where you whack him on the nose of the newspaper mm-hmm. I'm doing that to myself where I'm forcing myself to snap out of it and saying like if I'm going to have a fantasy mm-hmm. why am I making it negative mm-hmm Exactly. Like that's all it is. Is it's just I'm indulging in a fantasy right now. So if I'm gonna do that, let's have the fucking uh, red glitter convertible fantasy. Exactly. (laughs) And so I'm like, no more, no bad fantasy, no negative fantasies. There's nothing in there for me. And so I'm just trying to whack myself out of it. It's there's a lot of whacking throughout the day. (laughs) It's one of the things that I've heard a lot in writing workshops is you know if you're sitting around there like interviewing yourself after your amazing book comes out, mm-hmm. you, you need to cut that shit out. <laughs> it's like, you, you should be writing, you know? Yeah. And, and, and of course, when you're addicted, you, you fantasize all the time. I would congratulate myself on my sobriety while I was drunk. I would sit there and think about, mm-hmm. I was like, man, when I write about how I overcame this, it's going to be so oh, cool. God, that's, oh, and it's God. just like, if time travel existed, I would punch myself so hard. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> Fortunately, I feel like a lot of people are going to relate to that. <laughs> fantasy is great. I mean, obviously, I make my living off of it. You know, either I'm reporting in other people's fantasies or I'm publishing my own. Mm-hmm. But you, the clarity is what is important. And mm-hmm. once you have it, you can't ever get rid of it, which is annoying. As you said, it's like you're sitting there, you're eating, you know, a whole cake, and you know you're wrong. Mm-hmm. You know this. I know I'm wrong when I'm doing it. But yeah, I was actually just having a talk with a, a friend of mine uh, about love fantasy. So, so again, first relationship mm-hmm. lasted from when I was 15, 14, something like that. No, 13. God, I can go back and do the math. But yeah, first relationship lasted almost a decade from before, when I was basically a child until mm-hmm. I was uh, 20, 21. I thought with everything inside of me, mm-hmm. I truly believed that I would die without him. Mm-hmm. 
um, I think that is very common of puppy love. Of course. I could not exist without him, and he appeared to believe the same thing as well. Mm -hmm. I now am in a much different space. I am healthier. Not fixed. I'm healthier. (laughs) I'm smarter. I know that that's not true. No matter how depressed I've gotten after breakups, I know that at some point I'm going to be okay. I know this too shall pass. I know I'm not going to die. No matter how bad and sad I get, it gets, I know I'm not going to die without any one person. Mm-hmm. And part of me is sad about that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's There's a thing inside me that feels like that because it will never be that intense, mm-hmm. that it's not like the most like the purest form of love it's not as strong as it could be you know and i was talking about this i was like yeah it's like i fucking bit the apple Mm -hmm. there is no going back to believing something that intensely and that it would make me sad Mm -hmm. and it's only this actually a bunch of shit happened this week that i'm not going to get into but (laughs) uh, only in this last week am i like realizing that that's not real love and that it's not much different than taking a shot. No. You know, it's, it's, it's this fake intensity. It's a fake feeling and it's something that you can get addicted to, mm-hmm. but it's not real. It's, it's like we were talking earlier about like healthy lifestyle. It's like, you know what true love is? True love is cleaning out an infected, an infected spider bite on somebody's back. <laughs> okay yeah. I mean that's that's what true love is and mm-hmm. it's not flashy but it produces way more dopamine than the flashy stuff ever did it's like mm-hmm. I I mean my relationship with my wife is in many ways a fairy tale it has a great opening I was um 14, 15 years old, went saw Rocky Horror where she was performing. Mm-hmm. I heckled her. She screamed until I cried. <laughs> and you either have to never talk to that person again or you have to marry them. Those are the, those are the rules. <laughs> yeah. I don't you know, we've gone on adventures together and we've had mm-hmm. all kind. we've had the kind of love that gets written about. Mm-hmm. I know, because I've written about it. <laughs> and that's great, but there's also the nitty gritty of it. There's also the daily things. There's mm-hmm. getting up as I did last night and holding her hair while she throws up, even though I'm extremely tired and only had two hours of sleep. And mm-hmm. did you really have to pick this day to get sick? <laughs> so, you know, yeah. it's it's great to fantasize that you're having this amazing adventure, but it's it's no substitute for being able to, for instance, sit down in a coffee shop and mm-hmm. have a, you know, intelligent adult conversation about a serious problem. Yeah. I, I've been drunk on stage. You've been drunk on stage before. Mm-hmm. I'd much rather be where I am right now. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I guess I'm, I'm in a place where I am able to. So before I was like in it and didn't see anything because mm-hmm. I was crazy and drunk and blind. Yes. Um, and stupid. We were all stupid. Oh, very stupid. So yeah. stupid. And now I'm in a place where I'm still making stupid choices, mm-hmm. but I have the ability to step outside of myself and l- ask myself, why am wh- wait, why did I do that stupid thing? What was going on here? Okay, how does this relate back to this? Da, da, da. And seeing how the whatever, the codependency and the issues that I had mm-hmm. at, that led to my alcoholism how those things are affecting other parts of my life that I thought were unrelated, but clearly it's all connected. Yeah. And I feel like that's the step before being actually healthy. I'm like, (laughs) I'm closer. Yeah. I'm closer. I see, I see the problems. You can see it off in the distance. (laughs) I see. Yeah. I I see healthy in the distance and I'm, I'm questioning my actions versus just blindly doing them. I always think of like the, the healthy life like Vegas I went to Vegas on my honeymoon, mm-hmm. and we thought we could walk everywhere because you can see everything. Mm-hmm. So you see, like, you know, Caesar's Palace or everything out there. It's like, oh, we'll yes. just walk there. And then you're, like, half a mile there, and you're just like, this was a terrible mistake, and yes. I regret everything. But, you know. So That's you, so good. And then you get on the bus, and you go there, and it's great. Yeah. But, you know. the. But the, it looked like it was just right there. It looked like it was just right there, but it's just you're walking, and you're tired, and you regret your shoe choices, you know. And so that's 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 a healthy life, but you gotta get the, you gotta get the walking in. The walking matters, and it is its own story. Do you know how many adventures I've had on a quarter mile stretch of bad dirt road between here and my between my house and my daughter's school? 
<laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. Like dead bodies and rescuing oh, kittens geez. and all oh, kinds geez. of things. Like, if you put the work in just hiking into the unknown, mm-hmm. you'd be surprised what you can find. I used to hike, like I said, to rehab for my for my uh, outpatient. Mm-hmm. And I walked down White Oak Bayou because I really will just wander off into the wilderness without any uh, telling anybody where I'm going. Oh, jeez. Okay. Don't, don't do that either. Don't do that. <laughs> and I found this abandoned chapel on the side of the bayou where this woman had been um, raped and murdered. Oh, my God. And her family and coworkers had put together this money to raise this giant white cross in the middle of the field. And there's benches and there's bricks with uh, Bible quotes and we oh, love yous and everything. Wow. There's, you're never going to find it unless you just hike off into the wilderness like I did. It's like behind somebody's house. And to me, that is the kind of thing I never would have seen when I was when I was using, and I didn't have any interest in walking any place or putting in the hours anywhere because you just click on Facebook and you're in the online world and everything. But sometimes, when you have the space to go and experience these things, you find tragedy and beauty and life and loss, and it's all so much better than any sort of fantasy you're going to tell yourself. That's my little thing that lives in my heart, and nobody can ever take it away from me, and I fucking love it. Yeah. I logically understand the beauty in that. Meanwhile, I hear raped and murdered. murdered and I'm and like, yeah, that's why I drank, because I didn't want to see any of that. Well, <laughs> I wanted, I don't know if you know this, but people that create circuses to run away to, because yes. they want to run away. <laughs> I, but I, I, I can in, intellectualize, I understand the beauty in the human experience and the intensity of that thing. And I know that it's beautiful and to focus on the love that built the cross afterwards and, yeah. and the notes and the, the inscriptions and to focus on that. I understand it. Right. But I don't want to. It's <laughs> you are choosing to be unhappy. And I don't, I don't mean this general as humanity. You I mean, mean me specifically. I mean you specifically. You are choosing to be unhappy. The, the intensity of my emotions are stronger in general. Yes. And, so, and I think that's part of why I drank so much was to numb all of them. Of course. Um, but yeah, my, my happiness, my highs are so much higher than they ever mm-hmm. were before. Because the they're lows, real. Yeah, because exactly. They're real. Unfortunately, the lows are too. I actually just, again, had a, a thing happen last week, and I ended up reaching out to Andy Huggins. Uh, and talked to him, explained the whole thing to him, and he was like, okay, but how's your sobriety? And I was like, well, that's fine. I'm not worried about that. And he was like, okay, well, you ran into life. Yes. <laughs> he's like, you know, he's very sweet and caring, but he's like, you know, I'm sorry, but you yeah. ran into life. Life happens. What's important is that you didn't think about drinking to run away from it, and now it's time to process life. Exactly. And I was like, damn, you're smart. <laughs> it's, I mean, you know, it's great when you don't have this go-to to erase things. Mm-hmm. It's great whenever you're just like, well, I'm just going to have to deal with it. And you find that you can internalize mm-hmm. the parts that make you stronger, and you can eliminate the parts that, mm-hmm. that don't hurt you. You know, it just... Yeah. I think it just takes a while, honestly, though. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't want to lie. I think it took a while to figure out how to oh, yeah. do that because at first it all fucking slams into your face and you're like, this is what reality is. Yes. And that sucks. But I, I, I think it's worth it to figure it out. And that, that's one of the things that I think AA and, and, and rehab are good for is like, because you think your problems are great until you go in and you hear some other people like, I've never flipped a truck. <laughs> so, and, and my story is comparatively very small. I mean, I, I talk about the horrible things that happened to me that made me drink, but I never, I never got a ticket for DUI. Mm-hmm. I never wrecked anything. I never lost a job. I mm-hmm. never. The only thing I did was I had a chance to write for Rolling Stone, and I was so happy that I got the opportunity that I drank until I forgot what I was going to write about. <gasps> So that's that's honestly it's the worst thing that happened. Other than you know, I broke my wife and daughter's hearts multiple times. Well, I was going to say that that's thing but, though. Like that is you know, yeah. I didn't die. I've got all my limbs. You know, yeah. most of my brains. So I'm not any stupider than I was before. So yeah. that that happens. And AA is great for that because it gives you perspective. Mm-hmm. But everybody's bottom is their bottom. Yeah, you know. And I mean, there's people who've got it worse than you. There's people who oh, you know quit way higher than you did. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, everybody's got their story. That's why I like doing this. Yes. 
Um, okay, Jeff, it's time for final question. Final mm-hmm. question. Final question. If you could snap your fingers and people around the world instantly believed two things. They believe it. It's fucking just truth. It's reality across the board. What would they be? One, good for humanity. Okay. The other one has to be completely selfish. Completely selfish. Uh, mm-hmm. Good for humanity. That's uh, fairly easy. Vaccines work. <laughs> okay. They, 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 they work and they don't give you autism. And, and, and scientists can be assholes and pharmaceutical companies are vampires, but they at least are researching shit. Mm-hmm. So that's my <laughs> for humanity. Uh, the thing that I would snap to make people believe that would be um, completely selfish, um, that short stories are a good art. It is so hard to sell short stories these days because everybody's like, oh, nobody's buying them. And I fucking love short fiction. Mm-hmm. I grew up reading Harlan Ellison when I was 12. Stephen King, Joe Hill, Ray Bradbury, um, all of those people, Del James. Uh, that's, that's what I would change uh, mm-hmm. because I would personally benefit a tremendous amount. I would have <laughs> yeah. more to read and I would have more money. So yes. that's the thing I would do. We'll work on it. I think the pendulum swinging. You know, they talk about people, you know, everybody was taking in just like tweet level of information. Yes. You know, everything ends in excess and flips to the other side. And so I think that longer form is going to be I more attractive. So. I've, got a, I've got a book coming out later this year uh, that's all short stories that are less than 500 words mm-hmm. that are based around my word of the day calendar. Like <gasps> oh, I'd, I like that. I'd, yeah, I'd get a word of the day and I'd write like a really tiny, I was going to put them on postcards, but I am really fucking lazy. So I didn't. <laughs> So lazy that you're writing a book. Got yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, one of us mentioned workaholic, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't me. I know. <laughs> I'm working on it. We'll see. Um, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. I thank you for thank you for this project because it I it has honestly helped a lot of people. I have told them about it. I continue to tell people about it. And if you had a stack of those business cards, I would throw them at them like Gambit from the fucking X Men. <laughs> thank you so much. I, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When tomorrow comes around, I may be six feet underground, but I'll still have one more for now. That was Jeff Renner. He mentioned how every writer believes he's Hemingway, which made me want to look more into his famous quote, write drunk, edit sober. I've heard comedians quote it as well. I think a lot of people use it as an excuse, this idea that you must lubricate the gears to get the creative juices flowing. It turns out Hemingway never even said that. (laughs) Not only is that a fake quote, he said the opposite in an interview. A journalist asked, is it true that you take a pitcher of martinis into the tower every morning when you go up to write? Hemingway responded, Jesus Christ, have you ever heard of anyone who drank while he worked? You're thinking of Faulkner. He does sometimes, and I can tell right in the middle of the page when he's had his first one. (gasps) Burn! How do you like those apples, Faulkner? (laughs) I don't even know who that is. But while researching this, I stumbled upon an interview with Charles Bukowski, who was also known for writing drunk. He said, I used to always write while drinking and or drunk. I never thought I could write without the bottle. But the last five or six months, I have had an illness that has limited my drinking. So I sat down and wrote without the bottle. And it all came out just the same. So it does not matter. Now, these two are not the know-all, be-all of all arts, or even just all writing. But it does show that the tortured artist idea has been prevalent for generations. And it's just not true. Your creativity comes from inside you, not from a beverage. If it seems hard at first, don't give up. It's not that you're no longer creative. It's that you are finding the natural and sustainable way to access it. I promise. Speaking of beverages, I got a modeling gig last month where I didn't find out until I got there that I would have liquor logos painted all over my body and have to hold a bottle of vodka for photos. I had spent all day working on the podcast and then I walked into that garbage. I would love to be able to say that I said no and walked out, But that gig was covering most of my bills that month. And it was also booked by an agency who hires me often. So I would have lost six more months of bookings had I just walked out. It was a mind fuck. And one I don't want to repeat. So if you enjoy the podcast, please consider joining my Patreon so that I may cover the cost involved in a much less ironic way. (laughs) 
There's a link to more info on the Patreon in the show notes. There are also links to all my socials at Kiki Maroon or the Clown Interrupted Instagram at Clown Pod. And of course, the theme song, Last Call, graciously provided by The Last Domino. And don't forget to rate the show on whatever podcast platform you're listening to so more people can find it. Thanks for listening, and I will see you next week. Yeah, we got it.